One of the hallmarks of immersive sims is doing stuff with stuff, and by that I mean interacting with objects in the world. In a lot of linear first-person games, the fact that something is interactable is usually clear from the context, and you usually have to interact with the object in order for the game to progress. In Quake 1, you don't even need to press an interact button, you just kind of smush your face against it and it gets pushed. In Immersive Sims, however, the range of objects you can interact with is much wider, and the context might not be so clear. You also don't necessarily need to interact with it, it may be some environmental storytelling or just part of one, one of many options to progress. This means that we need to communicate to the player which objects in the world can be interacted with and which can't. Immersive sims have accomplished this in a couple of ways over the years, usually limited by the technology at the time. For instance, in the first Thief game, uh, arguably one of the first immersive sims, interactable objects just lit up when you put your mouse over them. The modern immersive sim Gloomwood also does this. This is pretty easy to do because you just modulate the model's albedo colour to be a bit brighter than it would normally be lit. This is okay, but I think it looks kind of dated. Um, I imagine the developers of Gloomwood made this choice exactly because that's how Thief did it. It was an aesthetic choice for their self-styled, quote, Thief with guns. It was a homage, right? The original Deus Ex did this by drawing a partial bounding box around the object in question. This is pretty simple to do. You just calculate the extents of the bounding box of the mesh and then convert those world coordinates to screen coordinates and draw a box. I don't mind this and it looks suitably cyberpunky for me, but it's not all that integrated with the world. It's like something on top, right? Some games don't provide any additional UI at all besides a context menu item. Prey does this. There's no indication in the world that something is interactable when you mouse over it, except for the context menu that pops up. I like these context menus because they communicate exactly what action the player is going to take, and they provide an opportunity to communicate additional options for the player, with more button presses. The most common being different actions for tapping and for holding the button. They are also more console friendly because it's not necessary for the crosshair to be over the object itself, you just kind of have to be close to it. Ultimately though, I tried to replicate the most common modern solution, which is to outline the mesh and to show a context menu. Drawing an outline around a mesh in Godot is not super simple. In fact, for a while I thought it might be impossible to achieve what I wanted to do. There are a couple of ways to do outlines in 3D rendering, and if you Google how to do it in Godot, you're mostly going to come across the inverse hole method. Basically what this entails is drawing another version of the model slightly larger than the first and inverting all the faces. This means that all the faces in front of the first model will be hidden um, because they're flipped away from the camera and the faces behind the first model will be visible when normally they wouldn't be, which is basically the inverse of what would normally be the case. So if you colour these faces black, then you have a kind of toon shader outline. This is what games like Jet Set Radio and similar would do. It has problems though. The main problem is that it doesn't actually generate an outline. You get a kind of pseudo drawing effect. And if you want a fairly wide outline, then you start to get really odd looking artifacts. It looks cheap and ugly, especially on uh, models with uh, sharp edges. In fact, games that used to do this in the past would often have their artists manually make an outline mesh to avoid these kinds of issues, and this is not an option for me. So how else can this be done? Well, we can also use the stencil buffer. The stencil buffer is a monochromatic buffer that we can draw to when rendering objects, and we can use the stencil buffer as a conditional for rendering pixels in a similar way that we do with the depth buffer. Long story short though, the Godot rendering pipeline doesn't give us access to the stencil buffer, so we can't do that. Another door closed. Okay, so let's look at what I was actually able to achieve and how I did it. This is the outline effect in-game. I think it looks okay and it looks suitably cyberpunky. I'm not too sure about the overlay effect yet, I stole that idea from a great article on Deus Ex Human Revolution's rendering pipeline, which I'll link in the description below. 
As far as I know from Googling, no one has done it like this in Godot before, and it does have some limitations, but none that are a problem for me, I don't think. Okay, so how does this work? Step one is to create a sub viewport with a camera that is in exactly the same place as the player camera. But we set this camera to only render meshes from a certain layer. In my case, it's layer two. We also make the viewport texture transparent and rendered over the top of our main viewport. So if nothing is in layer two, it's completely blank. Then when we want to highlight an object, we simply add the mesh to layer two. Because there are no lights on layer two, we basically get a black silhouette of the object. We can then perform a Sobel based edge detection post-processing shader on the whole sub viewport. And then we write that to the alpha channel and we get a nice pixel perfect silhouette outline. A downside of this technique is that we can't get access to the depth buffer from the main viewport. So the outline will always show on top of everything. I don't mind this personally, but your views may differ. Once we have the outline, we can just run a kind of bloom post process over the top to make it shine a little. The animated overlay you can see on the objects is created by dynamically adding a second shader pass to the mesh itself, which just samples a texture and draws it across the whole fragment with no perspective correction or anything. So it's always relative to screen space. I'm not totally sold on that effect yet. We'll see if it annoys me over time. I'm also a little bit concerned about how it will scale since I have to model the mesh in code at runtime to add the next pass, which seems like it might be a problem if I have other multi-pass shaders going on. We'll see. I don't mind scrapping it if it's a problem. Okay, that's it for this video, guys. Please like and subscribe and all that jazz, and I'll see you next time.